Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's February the 8th, um, a Thursday, and today we will be discussing the political troubles in Papua New Guinea. Uh, so violent riots erupted in Port Moresby on the 10th of January, which has been called uh, Black Wednesday. And um, it killed 22 people and uh, significantly impacted the business community and investor confidence in the country. So we'll discuss uh, that today um, and we'll talk about a few underlying issues. So joining me is uh, Mitma and Raga today for the discussion. So to kick this off, uh, Mitma, can you give us more details about Black Wednesday and what happened? Sure, they. So the unrest was initially triggered by a strike that was carried out by the security forces. And uh, the strike actually took place over the recent tax reforms. And following these uh, strikes, there was a widespread breakdown of the security environment, and it led to widespread looting and chaos. And this prompted uh, a state of emergency by the Prime Minister James Marape. Um, the uh, what happened after this was a very significant impact to the business community because it's estimated that there was a loss of around 340 million US dollars on businesses in Papua New Guinea. Uh, the, this unrest also shed light on the long-standing societal issues, uh, which include youth unemployment and institutional challenges in the country as, uh, as of yet. So, I think in our discussion today, we can talk about the volatile risk environment and um, how this is characterized by the various political uncertainties, uh, which can cause travel disruptions, uh, and which is also contributed by the tribal violence in the country, as well as the institutional corruption. Um, so, Raga, Great. sorry. Thanks, mm -hmm. No, go ahead. Uh, so I actually wanted to throw out a question to Raga actually about how Prime Minister James Marape is dealing with the existing crisis. Sure, Ms. Yeah. Just to add to that, Raga, uh, James Marape is in Australia today. Uh, I understand he's made a speech and uh, this comes ahead of, you know, uh, talk about a no confidence motion to be tabled. So could you give us some context on that? Yes, sure. So today happens to be a pretty historic day because James Marape is the first Pacific Island leader to address the Australian Parliament. Um, it actually marks nearly five decades since PNG gained independence from Australia. Now, in his speech, um, Marape emphasized PNG's unwavering commitment to democracy. And it comes at a very interesting time with increasing Chinese influence in the Pacific. And there's a lot of talk about uh, a security agreement between PNG and China, which Australia has been pretty wary of. And there were rumors about, you know, him not even being invited for this particular talk today, but eventually it did happen. Um, in his speech, he also mentioned the nation's resilience in conducting about 10 elections since 1975, despite a lot of hurdles along the way, including the recent riots, of course. And Amarapi emphasized the importance of the cooperation with Australia on security, defense, climate, and the economy. He has characterized the unique relationship between Australia and PNG as a big brother relationship. And he has um, expressed gratitude for the support that PNG has gotten from, you know, from start to now. And uh, this sentiment was pretty much echoed by Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese, and they both emphasized on the partnership between both the nations as equals. So um, as, as the speech concluded today, he urged Australia to continue supporting PNG. And it's important to note that political uncertainties are looming ahead for Marapi because he potentially faces a vote of no confidence as early as next week. Um, and a lot of people say that it could happen on February 13th because that is the next session of the parliament. Now, this has the potential to create some sort of political instability in the country because there is widespread discontent with the government, government's performance, including allegations of corruption and ineffective governance following the events of January 10th. These events were fairly shocking because they affected the capital 
it spread to other urban areas in the country. A lot of businesses suffered damage and uh, the ensuing political side of things is within his own um, within his own coalition government. We've seen quite a few coalition partners uh, giving their resignations. About 13 MPs from both his own Pango party and other coalition partners have resigned from the government following the riots um, and pretty high profile ones at that. So he, in, in return for these developments, he has said that, you know, he does acknowledge the challenges and welcomes the movement of MPs as a sign that, you know, the opposition is pretty strong. So despite the turbulence, he's overall expressed confidence in his coalition partners. And it remains to be seen what will actually take place um, on February 13th if the no, vote of no confidence goes forward. And uh, here I'd ask Mithma to come in with um, some history that we can get and some context into the vote of no, no confidences in PNG. Uh, sure thing, Raga, because like you said, uh, the history of politics in Papua New Guinea has been a rocky road to say the least. Um, and Papua New Guinea is no stranger to votes of no confidence either, uh, because currently this is the 11th parliament uh, since independence. And as of yet, the country has witnessed a remarkable trend of eight out of the 10 uh, parliaments experiencing prime ministers either ousted by votes of no confidence or resigning in anticipation of such motions. So from what you told me earlier, Raga, about how James Marape was actually expressing confidence in his governing coalition, it remains to be seen if it is just a show of strength or if he is actually not uh, considering the, these um, switching of parties to be a threat for his existing coalition. Um, speaking more on the history of um, motions of no confidence in Papua New Guinea, um, there were actually three prime ministers who were replaced through successful votes of no confidence. Um, and addition, in addition to that, three prime ministers opted to resign preemptively to avert uh, votes of no confidence. So. Despite these frequent changes in leadership, most prime ministers actually served more than two years in office uh, before being ousted by these uh, motions of uh, no confidence. Um, however, this creates a sort of rocky environment for businesses in Papua New Guinea. So I would like to get your opinion uh, on the existing climate for businesses and operations in Papua New Guinea. Uh, both today and Raga, feel free to jump in and um, let me know what your thoughts are on how this would impact businesses going forward. Sure, Mitma. Um, just to start off with, I'd just like to talk about the, you know, capabilities of the security forces and the security apparatus. Um, the Jan 10th uh, Black Wednesday happened because uh, the security apparatus was not paid in time. And uh, we have seen the PNG government, especially Marape's government, misallocate resources. Uh, police Governor David Manning, yep. <laughs> Sorry, uh, police commissioner David Manning, um, he was removed uh, following the unrest and then he was reinstated. Um, that's not a good show on the government's part because David Manning is considered to be quite the capable uh, security professional and he is, he does have uh, the resolve to try to improve Papua New Guinea's security apparatus. But the problem is because of the entrenched corruption in government, because of the misallocation of resources, the misgovernance and um, favors and nepotism, et cetera, uh, the government does not support the security forces getting you know, more experience and professionalism and training. Um, so this is something that we saw break out in Port Moresby where, you know, the police were doing standing nothing because they didn't have the incentive to. And uh, this problem of, you know, the limited capabilities of security forces, especially gets um, more complicated in the highlands where, you know, they aren't deployed as much. And uh, even reaching areas will be an issue because of the bad infrastructure. So um, I think this is, the politics is going to keep affecting 
the capabilities of the state to enforce security. And uh, this is not necessarily the best thing for the business environment uh, because it will hurt investment. It will hurt, uh, you know, perceptions on uh, stability in Papua New Guinea. And um, we could see more violence and, um, you know, we will see more violence, whether it's over this specific uh, political troubles or another issue that remains to be seen. Uh, but yeah, Raga, would you want to chime in here or something? Yes, it is. so there is one point I'll make about, um, you know, we, we were doing an analysis on the security forces and the capabilities, like you said, they happen to be quite underfunded and uh, there is a misallocation of resources. And our research uh, indicated that there is about uh, 300 police per 100,000 inhabitants or a ratio of one officer to every 1,145 people. So this, especially in urban areas where the population happens to be very dense and um, Port Modesty happens to be um, a city where there's a lot of problem of unemployment and squatters um, in different parts of the city. It is not necessarily enough to address the security gap, crime, disorder, riots, civil unrest, and these kind of situations. Yeah, Mitma, you were coming in. Uh, yes, Rag, I think you already covered what I was going to mention. What I wanted to bring up was that this is not purely uh, just a political issue. There are lots of other social elements that have contributed to the ongoing uh, unrest in Papua New Guinea. Um, and yeah, Raga, you brought out some statistics uh, based on uh, how much security personnel are um, available in Papua New Guinea at present. And we have also seen like more recently, there have been some uh, issues over the distribution of fuel. So all of these factors contribute to the ongoing unrest in Papua New Guinea. Right, definitely. Um, the economic and social challenges are a big part for the violence uh, because, you know, Papua New Guinea is facing economic stagnation. There's high employment rates and a rising cost of living. Uh, this is as the government is also trying to um, change the resource laws and um, change how concessions will be, um, how foreign companies will be able to invest in the country. Uh, we had released a report on that last year um, that you can reach out to us for access to. Um, so I guess one thing I do want to bring up is that uh, during the violence on um, January 10th, there was the targeting of Chinese businesses. And Raga, it's interesting that you mentioned uh, Marape's speech today because this comes after there were concerns about, you know, uh, more Chinese investment or uh, Chinese support in Papua New Guinea's uh, security. So it seems um, the timing of Marape's Australia visit uh, seems quite telling in a way. So would you have any comments on that, the whole China angle and Australia here? Yes, so there, so there is a China versus Australia sort of a geopolitical tussle in the Pacific region with both these countries vying for this larger hegemonic influence. And the Chinese influence has come in more recently, especially since they launched their uh, Belt and Road Initiative and a lot of infrastructure projects loomed um, across this region. Now, within PNG itself, there are there is a significant presence of Chinese people and Chinese owned businesses. And uh, it's not really the first time they've been targeted, uh, but there is there was talk of racial motivations behind some of these opportunistic groups. I do think that uh, apart from Chinese owned businesses, there, there were other groups. In fact, Indonesian and Australian businesses were also targeted. So perhaps this is more uh, a situation of you know, businesses being targeted, uh, which are vulnerable, rather than just racial motivations behind these attacks. Um, of course, foreign-owned establishments do have a disadvantage in these kind of environments, and there is heightened risks and vulnerabilities faced by non-local businesses, which is really important to remember. Uh, this is coupled with instances of foreigners being kidnapped in rural areas in PNG. 
And this sort of creates an overall environment where companies are deterred from deploying expats to certain regions, in, in, including the highlands where resources are concentrated. So today, his entire posturing and by going to the Australian parliament and delivering that speech seems to be a sort of a reassurance to the international community, especially from the West and observers in the US, um, Europe, and Australia that uh, he is going to counterbalance the relations between the West as well as China, and he is not necessarily giving up one for the other. So that seems to be his motivation. Right. Uh, thanks a lot for that, Raga. So I think we've talked enough on this uh, right now. If I could just get your thoughts uh, from the both of you on what you see as the outlook for PNG over the you know short to medium term at the moment uh, in terms of politics and security before we round this off. Yeah, so in terms of business outlook, the, the unrest did cause a lot of negative impact on businesses. A lot of business community leaders have come out to say that the overall business confidence is quite low. Uh, Mitma mentioned that the estimated loss is about 340 million US dollars. Um, and a lot of companies like supermarkets and um, other pharmacies were looted during this process. Um, and insurance companies have categorized this incident as a national disaster. And uh, the, the businesses generally have expressed a lot of dissatisfaction with the way that the government has assisted them. So the general outlook is that PNG remains to be a pretty high risk environment for businesses, uh, and particularly in the capital city of Port Moresby and the Highlands. Uh, and it is, it is observable that the swiftness with which the unrest unfolded highlights the unpredictable nature of the risk landscape across the country. And it poses a lot of threat to the safety of employees and the security of company assets in general. And the city's large population of squatters that I previously mentioned, criminal gangs with a significant presence of uh, illegal weapons and high rate of youth unemployment creates a fertile ground for civil unrest, which businesses need to be cognizant of. Um, and the cost of associated with enhancing the security control is uh, likely to impact the overall revenues for business. So these are some things that businesses need to be aware of. Great. Thanks a lot for that, Raga. Mitma, anything to close off? Uh, I think Raga covered almost everything there, there, so no further comments from me. All right. Well, thanks a lot for joining us today, Raga and Mitma, um, and whoever's listening on this. Uh, you can contact us for um, support of operations and travel in Papua New Guinea. We've done uh, several risk assessments, uh, community relations program, uh, projects, uh, risk mitigation, especially for the oil and gas sector, and we focus on operational continuity. Um, so again, thanks everyone for joining us and thanks Raga and Mitma for your insights on this discussion. See you next week.